Hello, everyone, and welcome to this Tufts webinar called Tufts on the Frontline of Care. I'd like to introduce our colleagues in the panel and begin the program, but before doing that, I ask you to join me in a moment of silence for George Floyd and our minority communities and all those who are experiencing racism. Thank you. Today we're joined by a distinguished panel of five colleagues. And our goal is to really share experiences they've had, their colleagues have had, and their patients and their patient population's experience around both the COVID pandemic, but also their experiences with the manifestations of racism in their community. As you all know, uh, the pandemic has exposed health injustice in our country with people of color and particularly black populations experiencing disproportionate rates or morbidity and mortality and also shouldering the greatest burden of work during the height of the pandemic. Related to these effects, but also independently, we've seen tragic killings of black men and women in our community, which has brought racism again to the fore. Our colleagues are gonna to try to share their experiences, each for about three minutes, between now and 20 minutes after 12. And then we're gonna open this up to questions and answers to really engage in a conversation with all of you who are participating. So please take the opportunity to submit a question using the Q&A function at the bottom of the screen. And we'll sustain those and get to those when the initial remarks are completed. So what I'd like to do first is introduce our five panelists, and then each in turn will give some opening remarks and we'll move to your questions. So the first panelist is Dr. Sarah Rosenberg Scott. She's an assistant professor in the Department of Family Medicine and a family coach, faculty coach, excuse me, at the Tufts University School of Medicine. Sarah served as a student volunteer coordinator for the Boston Health Care for the Progress Program homeless program at the Boston Hope Hospital during the height of the pandemic. Second is Dr. James Bartz. He's Associate Chair, Department of Medicine at Newton Wellesley Hospital and a Clinical Associate Professor of Medicine at Tufts University School of Medicine. Our third panelist is Dr. Ann Mosenthal, a relatively new arrival in our community. Ann is the Academic Dean at the Lay Hospital and Medical Center and prior to that served as chair of surgery at Rutgers University. Next is Dr. Helen Boucher, who's the chief of the Division of Geographic Medicine and Infectious Diseases at Tufts Medical Center. She's also director of the Tufts Center for the Integrated Management of Antimicrobial Resistance. And finally, Dr. Adam Normandon, Dr. Normandon is a graduate of the Tufts University School of Medicine, is now a faculty member in the Family Medicine Department at Maine Medical Center, but also in the School of Medicine. He serves as outreach director for the Preble Street Learning Collaborative, which is a social service agency directed at assisting those who experience homelessness in the city of Portland. So with that introduction, let me turn first to Dr. Rosenberg Scott. Thank you. Well, hello everyone, and thanks for having us. Um, in introduction to what I've been doing during this time, clinically I've been working at the Respiratory Infection Clinic at Newton Wellesley Hospital, which is a place that we can see people who have fever and cough, concerns for COVID or other reasons they might have cough, um, while keeping other ambulatory practices like primary care practices safe, we see them all in one location. Um, and that's something that's new that started during this pandemic. But my other role, which I am equally, if not more proud of, is organizing or helping to organize the medical students from Tufts to find a way to be helpful and useful um, during the pandemic, which is hard and was really, I think, the biggest 
issue that I wouldn't have anticipated when this pandemic came up was how do you keep students involved, engaged, learning, um, but also safe, um, as we were all learning how to be safe ourselves. Um, and so we had an unbelievable group of students who reached out at the beginning and said, what can we do to help? And there was certainly the role of, of supporting the frontline workers with childcare and grocery deliveries and things like that. Um, but other students wanted to be on the front line themselves. Um, and where we were able to find a way in to keep both them safe, but also help them serve their community um, was through the Boston Healthcare for the Homeless program at the Boston Hope Field Hospital, which was a 1,000 bed uh, field hospital that was created really within just a few days at the Boston Convention and, Edu and uh, Exhibition Center. And half of it went to be a subacute hospital for Partners Healthcare or Mass General Brigham. Um, and the other 500 beds were used by Boston Healthcare for the homeless program. So as they were screening people who were, were suffering from homelessness and finding that they were COVID positive, they were able to take them out of the general population and other congregant settings and, and isolate them together, which we know is better. People want to be isolated together. It's better for their mental health. Um, and keep them from spreading the infection into the rest of the community. And our students wanted to be there. Now, to keep them safe, they weren't allowed to be inside working directly with the patients, but we found Boston Healthcare for the Homeless Program had a, a critical need for themselves, which was to have people be spotters as their clinicians put on PPE, personal protective equipment. And for anyone who's worked on the front lines, you know, putting on the mask and the face shield and your gown and all of the gloves and wearing them for 12 hours at a time is, is a huge deal to keep yourself safe. Um, and so our students serve the role of being spotters for that, watching clinicians or other providers put their things on to make sure they were doing it in the correct order and taking it off in the correct order so that they could be safe while also, while those clinicians were taking care of the patients. Um, and so the organization around that, and we can share about how that, what that looks like for anyone who's interested, but um, that was the biggest contribution, I think, that we were able to provide to Boston Healthcare for the Homeless Program. Thank you, Sarah. Next is Dr. James Bartz. Thank you, Dean Bates, and thank you for inviting me to participate in the session. Um, good afternoon to you all. Through this pandemic, I have never been more proud of Newton Wellesley Hospital, nor of our longstanding relationship we have with Tufts. Um, as many of you know, Newton Wellesley is situated in and serves the suburban towns just west of Boston. Our geography includes a catchment that is a predominantly white population. We were so surprised then in this pandemic when nearly 30% of our patients were non-white and many were non-English speaking, especially the patients who were the most critically ill and dying we thought to ourselves, what is happening here? This population, along with uh, an overrepresentation of residents from long-term care facilities, bore the unequal brunt of COVID-19 in morbidity, mortality, and in personal loss. I remember one of my patients who vividly represents this systemic racism. She was a 52-year-old undocumented woman from Guatemala living with her two daughters. She supported her family by caring for her grandchildren so her daughters could earn money for the family. She came to the hospital on Tuesday and on Saturday morning, despite the most intense intensive care, she died from refractory shock. I had my fingers on her crowded pulse as it slipped away. Communicating with her daughters that weekend, my team quickly realized uh, that their family had no knowledge of how to navigate the system, even to provide an honorable funeral for their mother, nor did they have the resources to bear the thousands of dollars of cost. My senior resident and I flagged down our interim president who happened to be just walking through the ICU that Sunday. And by the end of the day, the hospital was able to cover the expense of the funeral with the disbursement from COVID relief funds. I have never been so proud to be a part of this community. I mentioned my resident because I want to highlight for you the heroic efforts that our trainees made in caring for all of these patients with kindness and compassion. At our hospital, residents from programs affiliated with Mass General, Brigham, BI, and Tufts co-mingle on teams working alongside each other in a wonderful learning environment. You may also know that trainees in medicine, uh, our students, residents, and fellows suffer greater rates of burnout than physicians in practice, even without a pandemic. Burnout, that long-term reaction to unresolving stress in the workplace, is characterized by emotional exhaustion, depersonalization, and a sense of low personal achievement. COVID-19 heaped more weight that had to be shouldered. 
the threat of, to personal safety, risk of not fulfilling program requirements, taking illness home to family, social isolation, and more made our trainees vulnerable. This was one of the many unanticipated challenges, and I am proud of how we cared for them as they were caring for our patients. Beginning in mid-March, a group of seven of us started meeting seven days a week to talk about how each one was doing and how the group was doing overall. We left each meeting with action items and tasks to see to it that each individual felt personally cared for and valued. Our new team of house staff started just this week and it will continue to be our opportunity and responsibility to see to their safety and well-being just as we are also seeing to their medical education. This is just one of the unique challenges medicine is facing now and one I hope you will continue to give some thought to as this pandemic rolls on. Again, thank you for inviting me to share with you today and best wishes in sustaining the effort to meet this challenge. Thank you, James, very much. Uh, our next panel is to be Dr. Ann Mosenthal. Hi, everyone. Thank you for having me on this uh, panel. I am the newcomer to Tufts and to Leahy Hospital Medical Center. I arrived here uh, to start my new role as Chief Academic Officer at the end of March in the middle of the pandemic. So needless to say, all of my plans uh, for thinking about the academic missions were put on hold. And since I did not yet have a Massachusetts license, I was not immediately uh, facing patients uh, during the pandemic. However, uh, as I searched for places to make myself useful and relevant, uh, many, many came to the fore. Uh, so Leahy really stood up an amazing response to the pandemic. We pretty much uh, doubled our ICU capacity very rapidly. I uh, had uh, many, many patients from uh, significant hotspots in, in, I would say, Essex County uh, and Middlesex County uh, along the North Shore uh, and many patients, as you just heard from uh, nursing homes and long-term care facilities uh, with a significant influx um, into our emergency department on a daily, if not hourly basis. Uh, this was a, obviously a huge challenge. We uh, very quickly put together a surge plan to have uh, many providers who stepped up from fields that they no, don't normally pra practice in uh, and created multiple critical care teams uh, really was an amazing feat. I would say that uh, a large brunt of this care was provided by our trainees and our fellows and our residents who did an amazing job and multiple nurses from all parts of the organization really stepped up to take care of really, really sick patients. Uh, the place as an intensivist myself um, and a trauma surgeon, and I've also done a lot of work in palliative care, I quickly became involved in two initiatives that were really unexpected. One uh, is the amount of death and dying that our caregivers were faced with and our families of the patients who could not be here. So we stood up uh, a communication liaison program of physicians and advanced practice providers who were otherwise not deployed, uh, who functioned as a liaison between the ICU team and the palliative care team with the families and spoke with families every day, had many of these difficult conversations um, and helped uh, all of our staff uh, care for patients at the end of life. Uh, it was really amazing, uh, I think amazing impact on many of these families who could not be there for their loved ones last minutes. And uh, it, was, it was really, really very powerful. Uh, the second area that I got involved in was uh, joining the team to create the crisis standards uh, around uh, should we be faced with the circumstance in Boston and the Boston area where we didn't have enough ICU beds or enough ventilators or enough people to take care of them. And uh, that was where we really began to recognize the issues of structural racism in our healthcare system. Uh, and this really took us uh, to a new place, uh, to really having to rethink how we 
how we uh, have areas in our care that are frankly uh, disadvantaged those who are already disadvantaged. Um, and this was uh, unexpected uh, on my part and certainly on all of our part. And I think all of the developments in the last few months have come to, to, really, to really highlight that. The, um, so I, I think what was also unexpected for me and for all of us was the incredible toll on our healthcare providers who spent months, some of us spent months and months facing patients in very difficult circumstances with uh, masks and gowns and um, very, very stressful. And we are still continuing to stand up the support that people need to deal with that even as the pandemic is slowing. Uh, and it is even harder now that we're not in a crisis to help people move forward into the new normal. So I think we still have more work to do. Um, and I'm proud to say that Leahy has embraced all of these issues uh, really directly and we are continuing to try to make things better. Thank you. Thank you, Anne. And again, welcome to, to Massachusetts. Um, our fourth speaker will be Dr. Helen Boucher. Thank you so much, Dean Bates, and um, thank you for having me in this esteemed panel. Um, you, so much has been said. I think I'll tailor my comments a little bit around some of the experiences we've had here at Tufts um, that really date back now several months since we stood up our Incident Command Center. Um, and then you know, into March when we went into all hands on deck mode and we had to take our team of 30 faculty um, and learn many, many new things in caring for our patients. So from the almost get-go, we doubled the size of the services that we provided. We doubled our ICU capacity. We in infectious diseases saw every, see every patient with COVID um, and provided support for our colleagues across the institution um, from training about PPE, lots of work on testing and lots of work on treatment of this brand new disease. Um, we had to learn about telehealth, which is a whole new part of medicine that I think is here to stay in some capacity. Um, and that was a novel thing, again, for people to embrace and it ended up helping to engage some of our colleagues who couldn't be on the front lines. And I think sometimes we haven't thought enough about the colleagues who couldn't work for various reasons and how they're gonna reintegrate. And that was uh, the focus of our concern uh, from the beginning and certainly part of our plans now as we focus on reopening. Some things that we're particularly proud of uh, include the fact that we stood up clinical trials almost at the beginning, uh, including trials of remdesivir, the one drug now that has authorization from the FDA in this disease, but also in a number of other areas so that we could provide the patients who came to us, many of whom were referred from other places, access to uh, hope uh, in the form of clinical trials. A job that I certainly didn't uh, anticipate was uh, around communication. I would say that dealing with this epidemic has been a challenge of communication at so many levels. We're learning every day. The rules change sometimes almost every day. Don't wear a mask, wear a mask. You know, what do we do with the patients in different rooms? On and on and on. And so we found ourselves communicating to our colleagues, to our patients, to their families who couldn't be here, um, and to the public. Uh, and that was and is you know, both a challenge and a privilege. I think that um, for us, that was a huge learning. And I think, you know, the biggest learning I would say for me personally uh, has been about fear. There's been so much fear about this disease, fear among our colleagues here at the hospital, fear among our patients, our communities, our families, and really learning how to deal with that. And, and it starts with acknowledging that. And I find myself, um, in so many conversations, often heated about what to do about a certain problem, taking a break, reminding everybody that we don't know all the answers and we are, in some ways, there still is um, fear in the room. So those are a couple of high level um, comments uh, from the front lines at Tufts and I'll turn it back to you, Peter. Thanks. Thank you, Helen. Very nice. I think we wanna come back to the clinical trials question too a little bit later. Our next uh, speaker, um, Adam Normandon. Thank you, Adam. Thank you, Dean Bates. Uh, thanks for having me and to echo everyone else's sentiment. It's truly an honor to be here. So thanks for having me today. Um, 
As Dr. Bates had said, um, I'm a family physician up at Maine Medical Center, um, but I think the key piece that I work on that I was brought here to talk about today was um, I work with the Preble Street Learning Collaborative, um, which before I talk about it all, I'd be remiss to not mention um, and say, say a huge thanks to Dr. Bates, who um, was a key leader both within our institution and, in our, and outside the walls of our institution and our community and, and establishing uh, the Learning Collaborative um, years back. Um, so thank you. Um, and a little bit of background. So the Learning Collaborative um, is a small medical facility that um, cares for those experiencing homelessness in Portland, Maine. Um, we are co-located um, right in the heart of, of the city um, and the community where most of those experiencing homelessness reside. Um, so we're right across the street from both the shelter, the largest shelter in the city, and um, most of the organizations that provide social services to our, our folks. Um, we are not intended to be a medical home or a primary care of uh, the folks that we care for. Um, we, we have a lot of those in Maine, uh, or in Portland, excuse me. But our bigger goal is to sort of bridge the gaps and find places where people are, are not able to, able, willing, whatever the barrier is, um, to access care. Um, so while we do have myself and a few other um, providers and we do have a full, someone there full time seeing, seeing people for acute medical issues, um, the real magic of what we do is work with um, a group called the Homeless Health Partners um, and they, they're a, a division of Maine Medical Center as well, and they are medical case management. And so a lot of any medical visit that comes through the office, um, the patients are, are hooked up with, with them to, for insurance or transportation or whatever other barriers it is that's, that's really struggling, um, causing issues for people to access care. I would say that the kind of unanticipated COVID issue that we that we have dealt with um, really has been alluded to several times. Um, but the the resistance, the fear, the anxiety of staff um, that we work with and the teams that we work with, I think um, these folks are we kind of off the record call them our guerrilla caseworkers. I mean, they're out in the street, um, finding patients, tracking them down, getting them to appointments. Um, responding to overdoses, working with really highly complex people with HIV and Hep C, and um, but when it came down to the beginning of the pandemic, and they were seen as quote non-essential, which I would highly highly argue with in in retrospect, um, but they were offered to work from home, and um, because of all all the said reasons that we've talked about already, um, everybody most people left, um, and so. That was kind of the, the low end of, of where we were early in the pandemic, and it was um, just a few of us remaining, probably three of us total. But uh, the story thereafter is, is really one of, of remarkable teamwork and creativity and, and hope, I think. Um, we, we did have had to work a lot to um, reopen um, or keep our services open. Um, which included things like setting up a tent outside and um, screening people for symptoms and fevers early on. Um, the probably thing that we're the most proud of is that we've been working for um, for over a year or two to um, try to implement the street outreach team. And that really took off during this period of time. We were able to really get out to places where people are camping or, um, or some short-term housing that was put up by the city and other organizations. Um, you know, we, we talk a lot about, like I had mentioned before, filling gaps in people's care. We really truthfully able were to um, get out and, and meet people where they were physically and medically and um, really work closely with our community partners. Um, also, I had talked about some creativity and I've heard references of telehealth. Um, so we had, you know, a lot of thoughts that went into um, if everybody's doing telehealth now, how are homeless patients going to be able to access their medical care? Um, and so we were able to obtain a bunch of iPads and people will come to us. Um, it's a, kind of a good example of what we do. It would come to us and, and be able to, to connect to their, their long-term provider. Um, we can kind of help, help with that as well. Um, so it's been, been an interesting time, but a lot of great things have come out of it. 
Thank you, Adam. Well, we're going to enter the question and answer phase. And uh, again, I would invite those of you on the webinar to submit a question using the Q&A function at the bottom of the screen. But I want to exercise a little privilege and start this off. Uh, I think virtually all of you have alluded to the impact of workload exhaustion and even fear um, among healthcare providers, but also in our society. And I can personally think of um, the polio epidemic and the HIV epidemic and other examples like this where, you know, the relationship and the model of care we want to develop with our patients to support them and their families is interrupted, sometimes with good reasons, but also some reasons that aren't so favorable. I'm just curious if anyone, maybe starting with Sarah, would like to reflect on that and give your observations. Yeah, you know, um, I this is a very personal uh, decision that I had made when I started working at the respiratory infection clinic. I'm a family physician who's been in practice for 10 years, and I actually made the decision to leave my practice almost exactly a year ago to take some time off to figure out where I wanted to go in medicine next. I wanted a different population, actually uh, spent much of the time engaging in, in learning about my own anti-racism work. Um, and then this started, and I was sort of sitting out of the uh, in, out of the of the active clinical medicine at that point, and I felt this. What what can I do? Right? How many doctors felt this? What can I do? Um, and I had been connected to Newton Wellesley Hospital, and so I reached out and said, "What do you guys need? I'm here. I'm a family doc. I got skills. What can I do?" And I said, "We really need someone to work in the respiratory infection clinic." And my husband, who's um, Dr. Andrew Scott at, at uh, Tufts Medical Center Floating Hospital for Children, looked at me and he was like, "Are you kidding me? Like you are safe at home with our three children. You want to go to the front lines. Um, what does that mean for our family? What does that mean for us?" Um, and there was a lot of discussion that went into that. And I was called, and we found our way through it. And I felt very lucky at that stage. Newton Wellesley, I agree, did an amazing job of prioritizing. We had as much PPE as we needed, and I understand what an unbelievable privilege that was at that moment to see, be seeing sick patients. Um, and every day I would come home, and, and I'm sure many of you who have done this as well, okay, I take my shoes off right in the garage, and I put them in the back of my car, and I put my flip-flops on, and then I drive home, and someone opens the door for me, and I go right into my laundry room, and I take my scrubs off, and I put them in the washing machine, and everyone knows my children, no one can touch me until I have showered and I come out um, and then I wash my towel. I mean, th these are the things that we're doing to deal with our own fear, right? Let alone when you're seeing patients and that in that room. And I, I know James and I've worked together in other places as coaches. And he said once in a meeting, you know, this is the first time I was scared of my patients where you'd be in a room with, I'd be enclosed in a room with someone coughing trying to get a history from them and just be sitting there the whole time sweating, being like, oh my gosh, what am I, is this scary for me? What am I bringing home? And then realizing how scary it was for that other person there as well, right? What I will say has always made it worth it for me every day that I do this is when a patient looks at me and says, thank you. Thank you so much for being here. Um, and, and so you take all of that, I'm gonna shower, don't touch me business. When someone looks at you and says, Thank you, I was scared and you have helped me. Very nice, thank you. Uh, I think another theme that I heard from a few of you was um, the new territory that COVID created. Uh, we didn't have the knowledge and maybe the skills either to care for these patients as we subsequently learned to do. And there was this period of innovative uh, care, but also somewhat anecdotal care that would mark the early phase of the epidemic. And I don't know, Helen, you referred to that. I wonder if you wouldn't mind uh, chiming in on that. Sure, so um, you know, from the very beginning, we put together an interdisciplinary team um, to start to think about developing treatment protocols. And you know, this was a, an episode in certainly my career like none other. We had people from all different areas working together in order to double the ICU capacity. We had to have a lot of people doing jobs they didn't usually do. Um, and we had a lot of people whose day job was no longer active. We had neurosurgeons helping with PPE. It was unbelievable sort of how the teams worked, but we got input from a variety of stakeholders into how to best care for the patients and continue to this day to update those protocols as we learn more about drugs and other ICU protocols and even diagnostic protocols. Um, but there was a real commitment to on-the-job learning and updating. 
we had grand rounds, I think five or six, maybe even more weeks in a row dedicated to some aspect of COVID. So we were doing, trying to share the learning across uh, the group as much as possible. Uh, lots and lots, as I said before, about communication, about really basic things uh, down to things like how to put on and take off the PPE um, that I do think helped, um, certainly helped us all feel more comfortable doing what we were doing and ultimately take better care of the patients. James, would you like to maybe comment on that as well? I definitely would, and thank you. Um, I, as uh, Dr. Rosenberg Scott mentioned, we're uh, we're faculty coaches for a group of um, first year medical students, some of which are listening into this webinar now. And I remember telling them that um, after four years of medical school and three years of residency and twelve years in practice, um, suddenly nothing I had learned could change the outcome for my patients that no matter what we did, their, their outcome was, was essentially set. And um, even in the beginning, we were causing harm to patients that we didn't realize. That initial protocols called for the administration of hydroxychloroquine, hydroxychloroquine along with azithromycin, and it was causing harm to our patients and provided no help. And um, knowing that nothing that I did could change their outcome made me also realize the particular privilege that we have in caring for these patients because even when we can't change the outcome, we can change their experience. And I think that was the biggest responsibility that, that we had to bring. And no matter how the patient would, 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 would uh, do in the course of their illness, we could change the experience of that illness for them. And that's the thing that I was the most proud of. Um, but it was also one of the hardest things um, to deal with is that we could not equate success with outcomes. Um, because no matter how hard we worked, patients would often not do well. We discharged, I think, 453 patients uh, well with COVID-19, and unfortunately, just over 100 patients who did not survive. And that's just an unbelievable number to me. And the other stress to mention, I'm sure um, many of you out there shared with me um, some sleepless nights, uh, difficulty sleeping, worrying about those that we were charged with caring for. And I remember uh, walking to my car every morning worried, uh, what if one of my trainees gets this and what if they don't do well with it? And in fact, um, 31 of the uh, interns that are based at Newton Mosley Hospital, of those uh, three actually had COVID-19. And the worry that I had um, for them, not for myself, but if something were to happen to them, I didn't know how I would be able to respond to that. It's a very difficult time. And I, I think that, uh, thank you for sharing that, James. I, I think the kind of individual shared pain and fear um, was frightening and, um, and shook many people to the roots of their commitment to the profession. Why are we here? What should we be doing? But there was also, I think, examples of people coming together in a clinical setting, but also with their communities evidenced by 7 p.m. shout outs in New York City and so forth that I think were, were very healing and heartening as well. And Anne, I know you, you, you moved to Massachusetts at about that time, and, um, but you know the New Jersey community quite well from your experience at Rutgers. What was that like for, for you and your former colleagues? Um, but maybe as well with your transition here to experience all those different emotions. Yeah, I, you know, it was, and I'm still reflecting on it. So uh, these are my, my thoughts up, up until now. It was, I mean, one of the things that I, I think that I've learned from moving to a new place when I couldn't go out and meet people and you know, no one could have me over and introduce me to their family uh, or even my colleagues down the hall. We were all meeting on Zoom and um, it was very isolating and it, it is isolating. And I think, um, and I've thought about that, that despite this great groundswell of uh, community building around patient care and um, we stood up here, a, a peer support program that I became involved in. Uh, despite all of that and lots of communication, it's still very isolating. Each one of us with a one patient uh, in, the, in the worst time of their life. Um, hard to share those deep emotions. And, and I, I think that's really 
uh, what's so hard and so anxiety provoking is that we don't have a, a community unless we really uh, very aggressively go out and find one. And so I have done that in, in establishing new relationships with colleagues, despite the fact that we might not be in the same room um, and sharing experiences that none of us had ever anticipated has really been amazing. Um, and keeping connection with my colleagues at Rutgers, uh, where they were experiencing the same, the same level of pandemic uh, as, as we are, uh, and in some ways even more so. So it, um, and I think I've been surprised at the ability to keep connections on um, Zoom. I mean, I am more connected with people all across the country uh, because we can do this. Um, and uh, that is a, a great thing. Um, and I think I've been also surprised hearing from colleagues who have completely gone to telehealth that their patients love it and they feel much more connected to their physician because they have their undivided attention for a period of time. They don't have to get in the car. They don't have to worry about parking. And um, so maybe we've had new ways to connect with people that we hadn't thought about. That's great, Anne. Adam, I wonder if I can uh, pass a question on to you. Um, one of the participants asked about PA and medical students, but it could be any trainee entering the clinical environment at a time like this, um, particularly given our recent conversation about uh, concerns for safety and other factors. What are your reflections on that being recently out of residency training and your experiences now? Yeah, um, a lot there. Um, I think that one of the most interesting things or one of the greatest things um, is the energy of medical students in particular um, and kind of um, like the stories already told about helping with Boston Healthcare for the Homeless, um, the number of students that from day one of this wanted to be involved in, in some manner um, and really, really trying to work with people to help harness that. Um, you know, I think that while, while there's a lot of risk out there, um, medical students and those that become doctors really want to help. That's what we all, we all went into this for. And um, I think that that wins out over a lot of things at the end of the day. Um, and so, I, but I think that for the lesson that I think we learned a lot for with the medical students up here was, you know, if you can't help clinically, um, what are the other ways that you can be there? And I, I think that um, it's kind of like a great public health reminder that, um, you know, just showing up and doing blood pressure readings because that's what you know how to do isn't necessarily the right thing. And that's maybe not the way to serve your patients. And um, the students that we worked with ended up doing um, putting together care packages for for our patients um, that had masks and hand sanitizer and um, and um, things along those lines and I think that while that was a COVID lesson I hope that that remains a lesson um, and, and that they'll apply to all 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 patients moving forward that um, you know our agenda and the patients might might differ and, and you can you can work on both simultaneously but um, sometimes sometimes prioritizing theirs gets you through the door. Peter can I hop into that as well? Please do. Um, for those for those of you who don't know the the students especially in their clerkship years that's their third and fourth year of medical school um, had been active you know seeing their patients through the middle of March and then COVID hit and they got all pulled from their clinical rotation. Um, partly to preserve PPE for people who needed it, partly to not overtax the system with additional teaching when we were all trying to learn ourselves what was going on. It was really quite hard for our students who were, who were in the middle of their clinical years just to now be sitting at home and on Zoom. Um, and we worked really closely to find how do we protect them, right? How do we keep them safe and not expose them? Um, but also how do they keep engaged in learning? Because they, like Dr. Barth was saying, they have requirements they need to meet in order to become physicians. Um, and they're just getting ready to go back now. So many of the third years in the past week or so, and then next week as well, we'll be going back and we are all figuring this out together. And so my advice to students would be to one, assume best intentions that 
your administration and your faculty are being thoughtful about how to keep you safe while getting you the clinical exposure. And like Adam was saying, to be creative because you may be doing telehealth now. We're all gonna be doing telehealth now. And so how do you as a student do that? Do you pre-room patients on Zoom and start getting the history and then your attending joins you and you present over Zoom and none of you are actually in the same place? Um, and while that might not be what any of you thought your clinical years of medical school would look like, you're in it with the rest of us. None of us thought that this is what medicine would look like for us either. So we're in it together. And to be flexible and to be creative um, and put yourself out there when you can, when you can see patients, use your PPE correctly. And if you're ever in a position where you don't feel safe, where what is available is not what's right for you, or you're being put in a position that doesn't feel safe, to speak up and advocate for yourself. Sarah, I wish you had been a preceptor when I was a medical student. Your infectious enthusiasm is terrific. Thank you for that. Uh, Helen, there's a question that I think that might be one you can address that really, the question was, what in your medical training prepared you for this moment? But you might also flip that over and what, what did you find unprepared for? Uh, so that's a really good question. And I was having a discussion last night with some undergraduates who are interested in medicine and this notion came up and I guess you can address it in a couple of ways, right? So I'm of the age where when I was starting out uh, in medical school and residency is when AIDS was rampant and I started when we had no medicines and then lived through, you know, the evolution of antiretroviral therapy. So I knew the feeling of not being able to offer treatment per se to patients but it was a different time in my career. So I, I'm sure that that helped in, in some of the other training that I've had has helped. But I think the skills that have helped the most have to do with thinking about how to solve problems, which um, I attribute largely to my uh, sort of liberal arts education and, and a lot of my mentoring in medical school and fellowship and residency. And then communication, um, so much of what's been going on is communicating and you know communicating to patients through the mask and eye protection that you're there with them um, it's really really hard and i think again it's i'm reflecting a little bit on my generation it was very very hard for me to see patients in the room behind the closed door and we all had to like draw straws for who went in because we had to preserve ppe and minimal time to hold the patient's hand and be with them and so you had to make every minute count you have to make every minute count with a COVID patient. So those kind of skills I think have been really, really important along with you know all the technical stuff. Um, I guess that's a high level answer. Very good. I have one um, really, I think almost yes or no kind of question in that from a listener about PPE. Is that crisis resolved? Do you all have PPE that's adequate or is that an ongoing issue? Maybe it's not yes or no. Oh, I can start, I mean, we have adequate PPE, and I, and I think in Massachusetts, we're pretty fortunate that everyone has adequate PPE, but the crisis is not resolved. The supply chain issues, um, we've all had to learn about supply chain. That's not a doctor thing, but we've all had to learn about it. Um, and the supply chain issues are real, and we're planning for the fall surge, but uh, this is an unresolved issue, and it doesn't just apply to PPE, it applies to testing supplies and a lot of other things we need for this epidemic. So very important to keep in the front of everyone's attention. Thank you. James, how about Newton Wellesley Hospital or Adam in uh, Portland, Maine? Right now we're good, but um, there will be ongoing issues. Um, the thing that I want to stress to the folks out there that may not have been said is that PPE really does work. Um, of the people that I mentioned that had acquired COVID-19 and any of our healthcare workers here, there's no evidence to uh, support that they acquired it in the hospital, uh, which I think is just remarkable. And the other thing I just want to um, explicitly state for everybody is that ventilators are not a hospital's most valuable resource, it's its healthcare workers. And so the health and safety is the, of the healthcare workers, which includes our students and everybody who is here, um, is, the, is the most valuable resource. Peter, can I just, um, can I just say a quick word about the curriculum um, question as well, uh, having, having just, just finished that up not too long ago. Um, I think that it's just so special that Tufts has, um, 
has a couple of unique programs, one of which I was involved in as a student and one that's new since. Um, but I think that having um, the community service learning program um, is pretty unique and that all graduates are doing, you know, 50 hours of community service and are getting out there and working with community partners and really understanding the, all the dynamics. Um, and, you know, since Jane Greer Morse, who's been there, has built um, a ton of supports for um, mentorship and, and really helping students get the most out of that. Um, and the other program that I'd referenced um, is the Sam Ho Health Justice Scholars Program, um, which again is new since my time, um, but I'm part of the main main representation for the faculty. And I, I think that that I would say basically the same things about that. And I just think that, um, you know, I think that medical schools, anyone can teach and learn and put algorithms and that stuff into place. But what makes a, a tough education so special is the dedicated time and, um, and efforts in those venues. Thank you, Adam. We're at the end of our time, but I want to ask the panelists to stay on a couple of more minutes because we've had a question I think would be um, very useful. And that is someone asked, I have family and friends who are working in the front lines. How can I best support them? Sarah, you want to try at that? No, I want more time because that's such a, that, that requires some thought. Um, I, you know, my instinct is to say is to not assume anything. Um, people are working on the front lines for all sorts of different reasons. Some because they're called to do it and they feel like it's their passion and their desire to serve. Some people are forced to do it for financial reasons um, or because it's the way that their job is structured. And even within healthcare, there, there are providers who say, this, I, this is not what I want to be doing to working on the front lines um, for, for whatever reason. And, and I would say to respect that. And when you say thanks for being a hero, to know that that is actually a little complicated for some people. It doesn't always feel heroic what they're doing. So maybe to ask them, what, what can I do to be supportive of you? And, and just not assume that we're actually all coming to it with the same, from the same background and with the same experience. Very nicely said. Anne, any last comments there? Yeah, I, I think I, I, I think what Sarah said is actually quite profound is um, don't assume. I think we all, uh, we all like to believe we're heroes. And um, I think this is all, this, all these events have put our, our heroic selves back into the public eye, but we're not all, we don't all feel that way. And I think there are times when uh, we feel the burden of not saving that life or the terrible outcomes uh, and the moral distress of not being able to provide the care that we think we should be providing because of no PPE or too many people or not enough this and not enough uh, people caring for an individual patient. I think that's the moral distress is really hard and so for a family to leave space to hear about that, hear about the really bad parts of it, um, and uh, making a space for people to share that if they want. It's hard. Yeah. I think if there's one thing I've learned through this pandemic, but also through our revived unfortunate experience with racism is we need to come together as a community and really try to understand each other and we're often so busy or distracted or otherwise committed, we find it difficult to do, but this has opened new venues for me and it sounds like it also has for many of you. So thank you for that. Well, we're, we could go on for quite some time, uh, but uh, I wanna thank our panelists, Drs. Sarah Rosenberg Scott, James Bartz, Anne Mosenthal, Helen Boucher, and Adam Normandin. Really very nicely done, thank you so much. And thanks to our participants. Your questions were very thought-provoking and helpful, and we appreciate you joining us today. Thanks.